Okay, so um, what my lab works, and can, can everyone hear me okay in the back too? Okay, great. Um, so what my lab works on is um, trying to um, analyze behavior of animals from video. Um, and so video is a very useful form for collecting data about behavior because it's relatively cheap to collect and non-invasive. You can just stick a camera above your flies and, and record them. Um, but from a quantitative perspective, it's actually quite difficult to um, come up with statistics to, of, of, how, of what the behavior of these animals are. Um, and that's because these, these images, while they might be very um, intuitive for us to look at and understand, from a, you know, from a numerical perspective, they're, they're hard to understand. So there are a million pixels in this image. It's a 1,000 by 1,000 image, um, which means it's a million dimensional time series. Um, and so what I'm just showing here are a bunch of different pixel locations um, over time. And that on its own is very hard to interpret quantitatively. Um, and so what my lab works on is trying to come up with methods for going from this video to some kind of quantitative, low-dimensional description of behavior. Um, and so, you know, we spend a lot of our time thinking about what that description of behavior should be and how do we automate the computation of that behavior, uh, of that, that description. Um, so if you're collecting video of flies walking around on a, on a dish, what types of statistics might you want to measure about their behavior? Does anyone have ideas? Okay, so throw one out there to get you started. You might want to know what the speed that the animal is walking at is. Well, how many flies? How many flies are in? Yes, how many flies are in the dish? Yes, that's an important thing. But let's say that you are a careful biologist and you're like, okay, I'm always going to put 10 flies in my dish. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, so yes, you might want to know the speed of the animal at a given time. Does anyone have other ideas of what you might measure? Having turning angle. Yeah, the turning angle of the flies. Distance the distance the between the flies, exactly, yeah. Uh, <coughs> Say it again. Presence density. The, the, the where they spend more, more time. Oh, where they spend their time. Mm -hmm. Yep, good, good idea. Like how close they are to the wall of the arena, things like that. Mm -hmm. How do they give relation to each other? P -p -posture. Posture, yeah. Um, and how do they, yeah, so how do they relate to one another? That's a, that's how a, do they move in relation? how do they move in relation to one another? That's a good, Thing is, it's not quite specific enough. How, like, what would you measure about how they move in relation to one another? The angle. The angle. Mm -hmm. change, yeah. One speed up, the other mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. Any Which other? Female is one male. Say it again. Male and female. Yeah, but like the the individual responses of males versus females, separating these things out. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so that's a good list. That's the type of thing that we spend a lot of our time in the lab doing is just like brainstorming what, what we might want to um, measure about um, the flies. The other types of things that we do, so all of the things that you guys measured were, or mentioned were continuous measures of behavior, like the speed of the animal, the distance to another animal. Those are all you know, numbers that, that uh, you know, that's not just a binary type of thing. Um, the other type of thing that we look at are categorizations. So like if you look at these flies, actually, um, these are um, flies where we're optogenetically activating some uh, neurons that cause the flies to back up. So we also do categorization of behavior into um, discrete categories, so like walking or stopping or turning, and you can say how much of the time do the fly spend doing each of these discrete behaviors? Mm -hmm. I have a, a, a more fundamental question. When you do these experiments, um, do you have an emphasis more on testing things you actually know already by observation? So do you, do you optimize your analysis on extracting things that you have a hunch is important? Mm -hmm. Or alternatively, do you, do you do a blind classification and hope that something, or, or see whether something interesting pops out? And of course you're doing both, but I'm just wondering, what's the, is there an emphasis on one or the other? Yeah, I think, I think you know, you know, so if you're developing methods for this, you know, it, it doesn't matter what you're going to do with this, but, but I think people do both types of things with this. So I think, I think that's part of the, part of this question about how you should represent animal behavior really depends on, on what you're going to do. If you know what you want to test is just, you know, how much of the time do the flies spend courting each other, then really, you know, you re and you only want to look at, you know, whether they are more social or less social or something like that, then it makes sense to kind of come up with 
you know, some particular behavior category like courting and measure how much of the time they spend doing that. But if you don't know what you want to measure, then maybe it makes more sense to do an exploratory technique. So again, my question, which is a greater focus in you? Uh, in our lab? Yes. Um, we do more of the latter type of thing. Meaning the... the, the exploratory. Yeah, okay, and the, it's more the unbiased classification of the data. It's not necessarily unbiased um, because you always, you know, so, but, but we do a lot of hypothesis free types of things where we, um, we collect a lot of data, we compute a bunch of statistics and we mine those statistics. And that's partly because that's kind of what I'm better at than other biologists is kind of, you know, dealing with data afterwards. So that's what we specialize in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. when, when you track animal position, is two animals bump into each other and then divert, how do you know which one was who? It's a, it's a question that lots of people work on. So the two ways that you can try to do this is you can, you know, the way that, you know, when you're watching um, this video, um, I don't know if these flies actually interact enough to, to, to show that, but you can kind of watch the motion of the animals and, you know, you know, you have these priors on, you know, that the flies can't pass through each other and they don't teleport from one place to another. So, so you can kind of follow their, which one is which by just kind of connecting them through time. Um, the other type of approach is you can try to have some way of identifying individuals. Um, so you can either mark the animals, like put a different color dot of paint on each animal, or there's some work from Gonzalo de Polivier's lab at Champollion, um, where he is able to tell these, you know, genetically identical flies apart, um, just based on, I, I don't think it would work on an image like this, but on some kinds of, on kinds of images like that. So these are the two approaches that that people use. Um, in our experiments, we don't do anything, for, at least for this type of data, where we actually need to keep track of the identity of the flies because we're going to compute population statistics at the end. We do need to keep track of identities for small amounts of time because we want to know, you, you need to have multiple frames of information to decide what the animal is doing. Um, so you want to be able to keep track for some amount of time, but not necessarily whole, the whole video. So these are all important questions that we think a lot about. Okay. Okay, so um, one type of um, behavior representation that um, um, we work on are these discrete representations where there are categories of behaviors that the, that the animals are performing at any given time point. So they might be backing up or chasing or courting or walking or stopping or turning. Um, and then the, the ones that we, we all came up with kind of looking at those videos were these continuous measures, like the speed of the animal or the distance between the animals. So these are two kind of different ways you can represent behavior. If you choose a discrete representation, where do you come up with these behavior categories? How do we, how do we find them? Um, and so one way we can do that is we can say, okay, biologists have been looking at animal behavior for a really long time. They've probably identified interesting things about animal behavior, and so we can just have the biologist say, here are the three categories of behavior that animals perform, or these animals perform. Um, and then um, what we do in our lab with this is we use supervised machine learning um, to automate the procedure of going from a video to categorizations of the behaviors that the animals are performing at each, at each time point. And that's actually what I'll spend the majority of my time talking about. Um, I, I thought that that was kind of one thing that I could tell you guys about was supervised machine learning and how that works, but we can, I have a lot of slides so we can decide not to talk about that if you're not interested in that. So, um, so you can use supervised machine learning for that. Um, or um, conversely, um, and I think this is what Bob will talk a lot about, is you could come up with some kind of mathematical definition of what a good representation of behavior is, and then use unsupervised learning um, to come up with your behavior categories. Um, so you might say, okay, the thing that I want to, what I think is a good representation of behavior is that you know, the speed of the animal is important, the distance between the animals is important, and I want you know, each Two, two, two video clips, for them to be the same behavior, they have to be very similar to each other in both speed and in inter-animal distance. And so you can come up with this mathematical criterion, um, something that looks like this. This is what k-means does. Have, have people used k-means before? 
some, some people? OK, a few nods. Um, so you can cluster the um, instances of the behaviors into these different categories by making these types of assumptions of what a good representation of behavior is. So there are kind of two different approaches to this problem. You can either assume that you know, humans have been looking at this behavior long enough, have some intu intuitive idea of what a good representation of behavior is, but can't write it down. And you can just use their definitions of behavior. Or you can use you know, some mathematical definition of a good representation of behavior and cluster into those categories. Does that make sense so far? OK. Um, so we try all of these types of approaches in, in our lab. Um, mainly what we've been focusing on so far is supervised approaches to, um, to behavior categorization. Um, and so that's what I'll spend most of the time talking about. Um, we also use um, supervised learning, supervised machine learning to track the animals. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then I'll talk a very, very briefly about the um, behavior representation learning that we've been doing. Um, OK, so how many of you have, are, have done supervised machine learning before? OK, good. All right, so this will be review for a lot of you. Um, uh, are, are you. Are those of you who aren't, are you interested in kind of understanding about how supervised machine learning works? Or is that, OK, I mean, it's a hot topic right now, so I thought I could explain it, but it's not exactly about behavior and one of, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I can talk about other things if you're interested in other things. OK. All right, so supervised machine learning. Um, OK, so uh, we're going to use the example of supervised behavior classification to, to understand this. Um, and so the, the goal in supervised behavior classification, as we said, um, is to assign categories of behavior um, to each animal at each time point. OK, so I'm going to use the example of chasing. Um, I don't know how many people have worked with fruit flies before, but it's one of the more common behaviors that people will quantify um, in fruit flies. And um, what it looks like, so these are um, 20 flies walking around in a dish. They're 10 male and 10 female flies. And what chasing looks like is the, the male fly will follow the female fly. It's kind of, you know, mice do this too. It's a, it's a pretty um, identifiable behavior. Um, and so um, the idea here is, in, so, so this is something that people who study Drosophila have been looking at for a long time. There have been people, you know, there are lots of people who just manually watch fruit flies, um, manually label when the flies are chasing each other and look at kind of these courtship indexes to, to understand um, various, various parts of the brain or genetics, right? Um, and so here we're assuming that we have some kind of intuition about what the behavior looks like and we want to automate this classification. So all our goal is we've decided already that a good representation of behavior is whether the flies are chasing or not, and we want to just automate that. So what we want to be able to do is create a program that, that inputs video and outputs these behavior classifications. OK, and, and as I said, um, video, while it might be very intuitive for people to look at, is not very intuitive quantitatively. So this is um, the, you know, this box of pixels here represented as the numbers that the computer is seeing, right? You can kind of see there's like a fly right there. Um, but how would you make a program that can um, automatically tell whether this fly is chasing or not from information like that? It's kind of, kind of not the easiest thing to do. Um, and so what we do, what we've done so far in our lab, is instead of using the video directly, we're going to track the flies first using automatic trackers, and then try to do classification on the trajectories. Um, so one thing that I worked on as a, a postdoc um, was tracking uh, groups of fruit flies. Um, so there's this program, C-Tracks, that you can download. It's about 10 years old at this point, but we still actually use it. Um, and uh, um, yeah, you can use it for tracking individual animals. Um, and so that gives us these xy trajectories of, um, of the fly's position over time, right? So that's what I'm plotting here. For one individual fly, we have the xy position of the center of the animal. And then we can compute a lot of these per frame features, as, I, as we've called them in our lab, that you guys were talking about, right? Like the speed of the animal how far the animal is from the wall, um, so, the, you know, so, so the kind of distance that the fly moves from one frame to the next, um, the distance between the centroid of the animal and the arena wall, the distance between a pair of flies, or the change in orientation of these flies. So we can compute a bunch of these statistics. 
Um, and we have a bunch of these that we compute. We have about um, between 20 to 100, depending on what type of animal that we um, are looking at. And then we can use these statistics to try to train, to, to create a chase classifier. OK, so what people have been doing for a long time was doing this kind of um, semi-automatically. So um, if you were trying to make a rule-based classifier, if you wanted to kind of use those features, how would you define a, a chase? You might say, OK, well, um, the fly needs to be moving for it to be a chase. So maybe I'll say that the fly has to be going at more than 8 millimeters per second. And it needs to be near another fly, right? So I'll say that the distance to the closest fly has to be you know, less than 5 millimeters. Um, and this turns out to be a pretty hard thing to do very accurately. You know, the, we as people can come up with a few rules, but um, it's, it's hard to come up with something that actually um, identifies the behavior very well. So this is what the output of a classifier, um, where we're just saying, OK, the speed has to be this, and the distance to the closest fly has to be that. Um, so if you look over here, um, during this video, I think there's a lot. So what it's showing when the fly is red, that's, that's being categorized as a chase. Um, you can see there's a lot of things where the flies are near each other. They're not ne necessarily facing each other. They're kind of walking close to each other, but not chasing. Mm -hmm. Why do you say distance shorter than 5 millimeter and not distance decreasing between each other? Yeah, so, so you could do that. There are all kinds of be uh, definitions you could come up with. Um, often when the flies are actually chasing, they'll both be moving. So the distance won't actually be getting smaller. It'll stay pretty constant. Um, so, but, the, but the male fly is still trying to chase the female fly. If the fly were sitting still, then yes, you could do something. If the female fly were sitting still, you could do something like that. So for the algorithm, we're learning something. You need some, some examples, right? So it needs to be trained on some, some background examples that have been selected by humans. So yes. you do the selection in the task, and then you say, OK, this is chase behavior, this is not. Yes, exactly. OK, and that is what we're going to do, right? So that's, the, that's a great idea. That's what we tried. So you can use a machine learning framework for this, where a biologist manually labels whether the animal is or is not performing the behavior in a small set of frames. And then you train a classifier. So you're going to use machine learning to find a, a, a classifier that inputs these per frame features that we talked about and outputs a prediction of whether the animal is performing the behavior or not. And that prediction should agree with all of these manual labels as well as possible. So that's, that's what, what supervised machine learning is, is kind of you know, doing this automatically. And then once you have this classifier, you can, uh, you can apply it to any new video um, that you want to. Is the output binary or analog? Right now, it's binary, the way we've been talking about it. But it's a, a question we'll get to in a, in a second. Um, OK. So the, so definitely, the input from the human is binary. The human has said this is either a chase or this is not a chase. Um, so these are some uh, examples. These are um, chases that were labeled by um, Alice Rivy, the postdoc in a postdoc in my lab, um, and um, we're just plotting the speed of the animal here and the distance to the closest fly. She's labeled something like 5,000 um, training examples. I think I'm only showing a couple hundred of them here. Um, the red points are things she's labeled as chases, and the blue points are, the th are things she's labeled as not chases. Um, so you can see that you know, our, our uh, original thresholds were, were not terrible, right? The fly, you know, when it's chasing, it's usually moving, and it's usually close to another fly. Um, but maybe we can you know, use machine learning to come up with a better um, classifier. Um, so um, the simplest kind of classifier you can come up with is a linear classifier. And what you're going to do is you're going to try to draw a line that can separate the red points from the blue points as well as possible. And so training a linear classifier is the process of finding the best line that separates your red training points from your blue training points. Um, and so what a linear classifier will do is it's going to give an output for any pair, any, any xy input, any speed um, and distance to the closest fly. And it'll have this linear classification boundary, where everything below the line is called a chase, and everything above the line is called not a chase. And you can see that I have this kind of um, blurry white part here. And that's because we're not using actually a 1, 0 output. But we do this kind of probabilistic thing. Um, so those of you who like math, you can uh, look at this slide. If you don't, you don't need to understand this. Um, so instead of you know, just having something that's going to output 1s or 0s, 
we're going to have something that's going to output the probability that something is a chase or not. Um, and so logistic regression is one of the most common ways to do um, linear classification. And so we have this linear function here, right? So this is our speed, this is our distance to the closest animal. We're doing a linear function of that. And then we're putting it through this sigmoid so that the outputs are always between zero and one. Does that make sense so far? Okay, ask questions if you have questions. Okay, so, so a linear classifier is kind of the simplest type of classifier that, that you can train. Um, kind of on the other side of things, there's a nearest neighbor classifier. Um, and so what you're going to do here is you're going to, you have all of your training points, you have your red points and you have your blue points and you get this new point that you want to classify. Um, and the way that you're going to classify it is you're go just going to look at its neighbors. So one thing you could do is you could say, okay, this is the closest point to this point. So I'm just going to give it the same class. I'm going to give it the blue class. Um, or you can look at its three nearest neighbors and you can have them vote, right? You can say, okay, two of my, nearest, two of my three nearest neighbors are red. One of them is blue. So I'm going to call myself red. Um, so that's a nearest neighbor classifier. And while a linear classifier has these you know, linear boundaries. A nearest neighbor classifier has these very messy boundaries, right? So you can learn arbitrarily complex functions using a nearest neighbor classifier. So this is what a one nearest neighbor classifier would look like. So you're only looking at your single nearest neighbor. And then a five nearest neighbor is a little bit smoother version of this. So you're looking at your five neighbors and you're um, letting them all vote. So the thing that's good about the nearest neighbor classifier is you can learn arbitrarily complex functions, right? So if the relationship between speed and distance between flies and whether they're chasing or not is really complicated, you can fit that function exactly. Any questions so far on that? Okay. Um, and then probably all of you have heard of um, deep learning. Um, Sorry, this is supposed to be here. Um, so deep learning is very popular right now. Um, and, and it's kind of something in between these two types of approaches. So with the linear classifier, you can only learn these linear boundaries. With neural networks, what you're learning are these nonlinear function relationships. So that's, um, you know, you can learn something that's smoother than this, but um, is uh, um, still a more complicated function than what you can learn with a linear classifier. Okay, and so what, what uh, deep neural networks are, are basically just stacks and stacks of linear classifiers. So we still have our two inputs, our speed and our distance between the flies. Um, and we're going to learn if we have 10 different units in our neural network, so each of these is a kind, of, a kind of like a neuron in some way, each of them is learning a different linear classifier. So it's going to take in these two inputs and it's going to output you know, uh, ones and zeros, and it's going to be like this sigmoid type of function where it's a little bit continuous. You can see that there's a little bit of a white line here. And you're going to learn 10 of these different, if you have 10 different nodes here, you're going to learn 10 of these different linear functions. So then you'll have 10 different outputs here. Um, and then this thing here is another linear classifier that you're going to learn on top of that. So while this one is, a, is something we can draw, right? It has two inputs and we can draw this linear boundary. We can't draw this one in two dimensions. This is a function of 10 different inputs, but we learn another linear function there. And so that's what a two layer neural network is. A single layer neural network is exactly the same as the linear classifier that we talked about before. A two layer neural network is just stacking of linear classifiers. You basically have these linear functions down here. You'll have a little bit of a nonlinearity that kind of gives you this thresholding type behavior. And then you do that over and over again. So to be a deep neural network, you have to have, I think, at least two, uh, three layers, I would say. Uh, so one, two, three. Um, and you can just keep stacking them. And that's kind of been the innovation in machine learning in the last um, five years that makes everyone talk about this is they stacked more of these together. Um, and uh, it, it works pretty well, surprisingly. Um, so this is what the outputs, what the classification boundaries for this data look like for different um, depths of networks. So the two layer network we saw before, the three layer, the four layer. So they're all a little bit smooth, but they learn more complicated functions. Okay, so that's one thing that we can do is we can play with the type of 
classification boundary that we're looking at, right? Are we looking at, you know, nonlinear functions, linear functions, nearest neighbor, complicated functions? What type of um, boundary are we looking at? Um, the thing that we've done that's really limiting us is we've only looked at two features to define chasing, right? We've said, I'm only going to look at the instantaneous speed of the animal and the instantaneous distance to the closest animal. But we've lost a lot of information that's in that video. So there are all those other per-frame features that we came up with, right? Like maybe we want to look at the angle from this fly to the other fly. Or we want to look at, we, we need more than a single frame of information to tell whether the flies are chasing or not. We need to look at kind of what they were doing before and what they're doing after. Um, and so really we don't want to be operating in this two-dimensional space. Two dimensions is what I can plot on the screen, so that's why I was showing that. But actually we want to be operating in these high-dimensional spaces. Um, so again, we had all of these per-frame features that we talked about. Um, um, and we have a ton of these, actually. So we come up with, um, you know, I basically came up with anything I could think of um, that um, could be measured from a, from a, uh, on a per-frame basis. So like we have three, we have a bunch of, for instance, different measures of the distance between a fly. We might care about the distance between their centers, the distance from the tip of the nose of the fly to any point on the ellipse, or the angle subtended by one fly in the other fly's vision. So you could come up with a bunch of these different features, and that'll represent just one instance in time. And then we have these uh, window features that allow us to, um, to describe what's happening in a window of time around the current frame. So we could look at this window around this frame, and we could take the average in that window, or we could take the minimum value. We can convolve it with you know, filters. We can look at the, the change between the end of this window and the beginning of the window. There are all kinds of things we can do to summarize um, things that are in this window of, 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 of time. So we came up with um, a bunch of these. So we end up with between 1,000 and 50,000 of these different features to describe a window of time around this. So we'll be operating in this much higher dimensional space. Okay, um, so, so yeah, so we can go to more features. Um, so, so we don't necessarily care about how well our classifier is performing on our training data. So think about our single, our one nearest neighbor classifier. How well do you think that will be doing on the training data? How accurate will that be on the training data? So you're, you have all of your training instances. You're going to, your new instance is going to be one of those training instances the closest example to that will actually be itself. So it will give itself the right label, right? So on the training data, the accuracy of a one nearest neighbor classifier is 100%. Um, and that, you know, that's not going to work necessarily very well on a new set of data that it hasn't seen before. So actually what we care about is how well this classifier will work on, on data it hasn't been trained on, right? So that's called the generalization error. And we can look at all of these different classifiers that, that we talked about um, in terms of their training accuracy and their test accuracy. So what I've done here is I've trained a bunch of these different types of classifiers. Some of them I'm just using those two features that we talked about in the beginning. Some of them I'm using 9,000 different features. Um, and then the other thing that I've done is I've gone from a small number of training samples to a large number of training samples. So I'm going from 2,000 training samples to 8,000 training samples. Okay, so just to kind of highlight something. So these points here, all of the circles, are the five different algorithms that, I've, that I'm talking about. All of them are using all of the features and all of the training examples. Um, and so. As you can see, training accuracy for you know, some of them is very high, but we really care about this test accuracy, right? So we care about the performance on the, on the y-axis. Mm -hmm. How accuracy is uh, So it's just the fraction of frames that are classified correctly. Um, it's actually, yes, I think, yeah, it's, it's just fraction of frames that are classified correctly. Um, and training accuracy is at the end of training? At the end of training, yeah. Is it, is it interesting or strange that you can have a higher test accuracy than a training accuracy in uh, the blue, blue circle? Blue the left? circle. Yes, I think that's, that's weird. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's weird. Uh, okay, so it's prob okay, so the reason for it, I can tell you why it is. Um, our training data here is not unbiased samples. Um, 
and, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but we tried to do this kind of active learning approach where we found hard training examples to make the classifier learn faster. So the accuracy on the training, it, those could be harder examples than the test data, which is randomly chosen. Yeah, good, good question. Um, right, okay, so, um, so the first thing to notice, I think, is you know, there are all these different algorithms they're all using, so all of them are using these 9,000 features, and they're all using a lot of, a lot of training samples. Um, and these are three different algorithms. One is boosting, which I didn't tell you about, which is actually what we use um, for the system that we came up with. Um, but the uh, uh, two-layer neural network is this green one here, and then the k-nearest neighbor is this uh, light blue one here. And their performance on the test data is all pretty similar. So the thing that actually mattered the most, right, in kind of differentiating these things was not which of these classification boundary uh, types you use. When you get into high dimensions, a linear classifier can be really complicated, actually. Um, and um, so, so here you need a lot of training examples, you get a lot of features, and then you can do quite well. It doesn't really matter what your classification algorithm is. Um, to highlight another, um, Group. These squares here are uh, four different types of algorithms. All of them are using lots of features, so they're using 9,000 features, but they only have 2,000 training examples. So they do really well on the training data. They can fit the data really well because they have all of these features to learn you know, complicated functions from, but they don't generalize very well to the test data. So it's very important to have a lot of training examples. You can get complexity in your classifier by adding more features. Um, but it doesn't necessarily give you good generalization error. And then these triangles here are the, the kind of test examples I was showing where you only have two features and you only have 2,000 training examples. Um, and then we can look at kind of the different types of algorithms. Um, and yeah, a lot of them perform pretty similarly. Um, the, the linear classifier, right, which is a very simple idea, actually performs pretty well when, um, when you look at its test accuracy in this high dimensional space. <coughs> Any questions on this, Jeffrey? Yeah. So here in these examples, you're showing us the two extremes. You're showing two features, mm -hmm. and 10,000 features, and you already said that uh, this is an overcomplete set. So what I'm wondering is, so as you are going in higher dimensions, you increase the sparsity of the space. Mm -hmm. So then, as you say, like having a linear classifier becomes impossible, and then like your the performance of the classifier is dropping because of the sparsity. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, is there, from an intuitive or a theoretical perspective, uh, a number of features that would uh, that would behave optimally mm -hmm. for the classification, and it, which would be better than using this overcomplete set of 10,000? Yes, so there, so there definitely is, but you don't necessarily know it beforehand what it should be, right? You don't know which of those features is the right one, um, and you don't know how many of them you need, right? So, so uh, kind of in the extreme, if my feature that I came up with was the actual class of whether the fly was chasing or not, then I just need that one feature, and I'll do really well, right? I don't need a lot of training examples. I'll, I'll do really well. But I don't have that perfect feature. I just have these things that I invented um, and are pretty general purpose that I can use for a lot of different behaviors. So, so yeah, so you can, so one thing with supervised learning um, is it can ignore relevant, irrelevant features as long as you give it enough training data that it can tell that this feature is irrelevant, right? So if you have, a small number of, fe of training examples, so there's 2,000 training examples. Um, with 9,000 features, it overfits, so it doesn't learn which features are actually irrelevant and which features are relevant um, very well. Um, and so that, but, but what you can do is you can just keep adding more training data. That's something you can do as a user of the system, right? You can just label more data. It's actually not, it's a lot easier to label data than it is to think hard. Um, and so you can just label some more data and you can, have it learn which of those features are irrelevant. So even if I just add noise to this, and um, that was the thing that I took out of this presentation, but you can keep adding noise features to this. Um, and if you have enough training data, it will ignore those noise features. So if 
fire on this lower dimensional mm -hmm. space. Is there, could you maybe share some information? Yeah, so, so if you did PCA and a linear classifier, for example, so PCA is a linear function, what it's learning. Uh, as everyone know, principal component analysis, you're just kind of finding a linear projection of your data that preserves as much variance of the data as possible. So if you do PCA and then you do a linear classifier, that's a linear function followed by another linear function, which is within the space of functions you're searching when you do, when you train a linear classifier. So from a theoretical perspective, it shouldn't necessarily perform any better than um, if you just did the linear classification to begin with. So, so it doesn't necessarily help um, to do that kind of unsupervised dimensionality reduction. It might, but it might not. You don't really know what's going to happen. Um, so um, it, would ha it would only help if there's kind of some other information that's going into PCA that isn't going into this linear training, right? So, so it often actually doesn't help to do that, you can, the things that you can do, is you can do things like have a holdout set of your data. You can, you know, you have 8,000 training examples, but I'm going to keep 2,000 of them set aside and I'm going to train on 6,000 of them. And then I'm going to do a sub-selection of which features are important by looking at its performance on this held out data set. So you can do things like that to try to get the, the generalization to, to work better. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of what people struggle with, is how many features should I have? How much training data do I need? And actually, one of the things that this deep learning has allowed to have happen is to have the number of input features be much higher than it used to be. So um, when I started doing computer vision in 2000, what everybody worked on was engineering features. They would try to come up with these, you know, the perfect set of 10 features to describe an image. Um, and what um, using deep learning, which can learn these very complicated functions, allowed people to do is to go directly to working on the raw images and learn very complicated functions of the raw images um, in a way that somehow doesn't overfit to the data. Um, and that's kind of what the, the, um, the idea with deep learning is, is that each of these layers in this network is a different feature representation that's been learned. So you're not throwing away any data by you know, coming up with your engineered feature set, but you're somehow learning what a good feature representation is. But that's, that's like an inherent question in machine learning is, you know, what should my feature representation be? Does that answer your question? Okay. Mm -hmm. You ask her to classify behavior, like to come up with what it, it sees. Mm -hmm. Something like that, and see what's going on, whether it's come up with a, with a chase thing or whatever. Yeah, so that's what unsupervised machine learning would be doing. Um, it, and so, so um, I think Bob is going to talk about that. Is that right, Bob? Yeah. Okay, so he'll give you some examples of how you can do unsupervised machine learning to do this. Um, what you have to do there, you, you can't just have no assumptions, right? You can't just give it a video and say, figure stuff out. Um, you have to tell it what a behavior, what, what, what types of things you want it to figure out. So you have to do things like say, the two features that are important are the distance between flies and the speed of the flies. And in this case, with unsupervised learning, it's very sensitive to the exact representation that you give it. You can't give it these irrelevant features and have it ignore them. If you give it noise data, it will try to use that noise for doing the clustering. Uh, so my question is maybe more philosophical one, if you go for the can perspective about the world. So if a baby was born into the world, does it have any prayer in it or like rules that you need to follow or you just look for the walls and try to find the right thing. So you said it must be something beforehand, like a rules that you give the machine something about what to look for. So, so a, a baby in the world is not just observing the world without having any kind of other signal, right? So, so there's supervised learning. On the other side, there's unsupervised learning, and there's a whole thing in between, like reinforcement learning. Have people heard of reinforcement learning? Um, where a baby might be, you know, we'll, we'll see, we'll have something, it will 
be, give it a painful or it will give it a reward if it picks that thing up, right? And so it will learn that this is an important categorization there. So there's some kind of signal. It's not saying you know, exactly what this is, but it's some kind of signal that the, that the baby can learn from. There's also some things that are innate, right? So there are some features that you know, are, are um, you know, evolutionarily set, right? Um, and so those are some things that you know, like the, 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 what, what your retina does, for instance, right? That's not necessarily something that's learned. That's something that's, you know, just there. Um, and that's been learned by evolution, right? Um, and so, you know, there's, there's uh, yeah, so, so there's kind of those two types of things that, that exist. Um, and that's kind of, you know, what people are working on a lot now is, is we don't necessarily want to set what these behaviors are, what these categories are, but we don't necessarily also want to just give it zero information. We want to, you know, have a little bit of signal that we're giving it about that that we trust of like, you know, this is a reward signal. This is, you know, these two features are, or these two behaviors are more similar than these two behaviors. But we have to figure out exactly how to pose that problem. Does that answer your question? More or less, it was more like a theoretical question, whether if, if at all we would come up with something that makes sense if we give it zero thing, just like asking the machine, look at the world and tell us rules. You can, you, can, you can try to do that. There are a lot of rules that it can come up with. And the, the other thing that I would argue is there's not one right behavior representation for every possible task, right? It depends what you're going to do with it. Um, and so, so definitely that means that you can't just give it something and have it come up with the perfect thing. I just wonder how this yeah. result will be similar to what yeah. a human observer will see. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's a good question. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I think, you know, this is a thing that I think Bob and I spend a lot of time thinking about. You say you introduced 9,225 teachers in your neural network. They're not orthogonal, all orthogonal to each other, right? There's they are not, yeah. A lot of uh, redundancy. So why do you feed them so many features? So, 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 yeah, so uh, you don't necessarily need to do that, but actually the... <coughs> classifier function that it's, that the, the, fu the family of functions that it's searching in this classifier are not all possible functions. So there's a different set of functions you can compute from the 9,000 features than you can from the orthogonal representation of 50 features that encompasses everything, right? So, so, so this data here, right? So there are, 8, 000, or there are 2,000 training examples. That means I can definitely project this down to 2,000 dimensions, and I can capture everything um, about them, right? I can reconstruct the data from that. But it's actually a different set of functions that you are looking at. Um, so so the, it's, it's because you have features, you have the classifier family and what types of functions it's searching, and th those two things interact. It's not searching all possible um, classifier functions. It doesn't, okay, so in theory, if you have an infinite number of nodes in your neural network, then you can learn any function. If you have a finite number of nodes in a specific architecture, you can learn specific functions. They seem arbitrarily complex. We don't know the limits of what it can and can't learn, but it's not everything. The other thing that there is in neural networks, and this is kind of getting into what people in machine learning are study, studying, there's, um, some bias in the neural network for preferring one type of function to another type of function. So there's some kind of regularization that's happening that makes it prefer, so, so, so people were astounded that these deep networks worked at all because you have, you know, in some of them you might have 50 million parameters that you're fitting from 2,000 training examples um, and you would think it would overfit terribly, right? But it turns out that it works pretty well. And that's, we think, because there's some kind of regularization happening that, you know, whatever the architecture that we've chosen is, some of the things we've, we've built into this, it's preferring simpler functions in some way. And so that's the thing that people in machine learning are studying, is, you know, what types of functions do neural networks prefer over others? Does that answer your question? Okay. To me, all these circles, they should be one with train accuracy. Yes. yes, one is the best. Is that your question? No, I mean they should be. You have to stop your train. Uh, so the... Uh, all the circles, they should be one with train accuracy. No, not necessarily. So... Um, the number of <coughs> is less than each 
and it's a linear I can put one line and separate two dots. Uh, but I have uh, so this is I have uh, two thousand training examples. Uh, or, or uh, sorry, 8,000 training examples. So the training accuracy, so I can't actually come up with a line that can perfectly separate my 8,000 training examples. And, and uh, it could be, for instance, that somebody, somebody labeled, you know, that, that, two, that a chase and a non-chase actually have exactly the same values for those features, right? And then they're definitely not separable. Oh, that's the mistake of the... It could, it, it wouldn't otherwise, necessarily... Otherwise, whenever a feature space dimension is higher than samples, train any train, you should get a hundred percent. For, uh, for which one? For this one here, for the linear? Yeah. Um, so the uh, linear 8,000, 9,000 features here. So, so I think it's, it's just, it might not be a mistake in the labeling. It just might be that there's something about the differences in these two behaviors that's not captured in these 9,000 features. So they might look identical in these 9,000 features, but they might be different in some way that we're not um, measuring. Or it could be that the labeling was, um, yeah, not as good. But you can see that the training accuracy is, is pretty, pretty high here, right, for all of these. But yeah, it, it is trained, so, Logistic, reg I th I'm pretty sure it's trained until the, it's getting the optimum value. Um, yeah. But it's a good question. Yeah, I thought always n minus 1 dimension. Only if the features are actually discriminative enough. But it's yes, it's, it's correct. Yeah, I have a more practical question. So, some case, in some cases, it's not so easy. Um, yeah, so the way that we did this, so I'll talk about how we actually train this thing uh, in, a, in a second, but um, we have a set of training data that we collect just to try to train things, and then afterwards, once we're done with everything, um, then we collect a test data set because we don't want our, you know, we don't want to overfit to our test data. Um, I think that, you know, it, it kind of, it's, it's hard to know how big any of these things have to be, and it depends on, um, so, so I think our test data set here, I think there's about 5,000 uh, examples in our test data here. Um, and it kind of depends on how rare the types of mistakes you want to find are. So mo if you're doing kind of random sampling of all of the frames, they're mostly going to be easy examples. Um, so it's, yeah, it's pretty hard to kind of figure out what that size should be. So the test data is completely separate from these training examples. Okay, so I have a completely different set of data. That's the test data. Um, and do you have an answer why the three-layer network performs worse than the two-layer one? So in overall comparison, because normally, yeah, I, I, for me, it seems to me that it should be better than the two-layer one. Yeah, I mean, so that's kind of the, okay, so yeah, so there's this thing called the bias variance trade-off. Um, so the more complicated your classifier is, it, the more it can potentially overfit to your data, right? So a three-layer network is more complicated than a two-layer network. There's other things involved here, too, because with neural networks, when you're doing the optimization, when you're trying to find that best classifier, you're not actually finding the best classifier. You're using gradient descent. Um, it's kind of this... Uh, um, you're finding some classifier that's pretty good, right? So it could also be differences in the optimization, um, but or it's it's overfitting. Those are the kind of two options, um, basically there. But yes, so there's this bias variance trade-off, and this is um, one of the inherent thing or the mo like the most important things that you learn about in uh, in machine learning. Um, so. There's, um, you know, if you have a more complicated classifier family, like a three-layer network versus a two-layer network, a three-layer network is more complicated set of functions that you're searching than a two-layer network. So you can fit the data boundaries better, which they call less bias, right? So you're, you're, um, you're, you're going to fit the correct result, the training data very well. 
but you can overfit. Um, so you need more training data. And what they, say, what they call it is more variance because depending on which training data set you give it, you give it a sample, this sample of 2,000 training examples or that sample of 2,000 training examples, you'll get very different classifier results. So that's what they call the variance of this classifier family. And so the bias variance trade-off is kind of between you know, how complex or how much bias there is and how, um, and how much variance there is, how, much general, how, how, how well it will generalize. And so we talked about a bunch of different types of classifiers, right? So there was you know, the linear 2D classifier. And so that's something that has pretty high bias because our training error won't be very good, right? We're not going to fit our boundaries very, very well. But it will generalize pretty well. No matter which set of training data I give it, it will give me basically the same results. So that's a low variance, high bias. And kind of on the other end of things is this k nearest neighbor, right, where we know it can fit the boundaries of the training data perfectly, so it's going to have low bias. But depending on which training data set you give it, you're going to get very different results, and it's going to have a high variance. Um, so this is something that people spend a lot of time thinking about. What you want to be is kind of in this corner here. And so people are always trying to come up with the algorithm that has, you know, can fit any possible data set that, that exists, but also generalizes well. And that's somewhere where people think deep learning is, where you know, it can fit really complicated functions, but somehow it generalizes well despite that fact. And it has some kind of regularization that it's allowing, that's allowing it to do that. Any questions? Any more questions? <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think that was kind of my point is like you have 95% here and maybe 92% here. How different are those really? And, and that kind of depends, right? So what it, uh, it's really hard, you know, you can get this single number to measure how well your system is doing on test data, but that doesn't really give you the whole story. You know, we end up actually looking at a lot of, t you, know, the perf you know, what different classifiers are doing on specific examples because there's, uh, if, the, you know, if, if you give it a really easy example and one classifier gives you the wrong result and another one gives you the right result, you're really gonna prefer that right result. If you give it a hard example where you're not sure what the correct classi classification is, you know, that, then you might not care whether the two algorithms differ on, on that or whether it gets that right or not. Um, and so, and it's really hard to kind of, you know, some of these examples might be more important than others, I guess, is, is what I'm trying to say. And you, it's very hard to just look at a number and decide this is good enough. Yes, yeah. The human annotator is not necessarily perfect. Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. So um, for chasing, actually, we, we did this. Um, we had 13 different people at Genelia train chase classifiers and um, annotate the same ground truth data. And we had them annotate with two levels of confidence. We had ones where they were like, yes, I'm very sure that these are the same behavior. And then ones where they were like, I, I would call this a chase, but I'm not, you know, I would be okay if the classifier, you know, didn't, didn't say that because it's kind of ambiguous. And so for the things where they called it important that the classifier get this right, I think the, 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 um, so we had them labeled 2,000 examples. I think that the, the, it, w it was very high. It was something like 98% agreement. Um, so higher than this. Um, but for, the, for frames where, the, um, he, where people were like, this is not that important, then it was on the order of 70%. Um, so it seemed really important to you know, distinguish between things that were where uh, people kind of know what's their personal bias and what is not. And um, Chase is an example of a behavior that people have been looking at for quite a while and does seem fairly discreet. Um, and you know, people agree pretty well on some of the other behaviors that we've looked at, like walking backwards, for instance, I would say that the, you know, 
my, I, I felt very uncertain when I was training uh, backing up the classifier because how fast does a fly have to be walking backwards for you to call it a backward walk? Um, and, and so, yeah, it, it's going to depend on the behavior, how, how, you know, uh, how well people will, you know, uh, perform, you know, do the same labeling twice. Sure, and then this is um, uh, only considering the perfect examples, right? These are considering the important examples, yeah. <coughs> That's a good question, yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of, I think you guys are getting into a lot of the nuances of, of you know, how behavior, supervised behavior classification, the things you really care about um, with this. All right, any other questions? Okay. Um, so yeah, so um, we, tr we created this system called Java. Um, you can download it here for um, training these behavior classifiers. Um, and um, the, the thing that I think I wanted you guys to, to see was one of the most important um, uh, considerations was not which classifier algorithm you were using, but actually how much training data you had. And so one thing that we found was it was important to get a lot of training data, and it was important to get good, accurate training data. Um, and so we spent a lot of time on the user interface for how people enter training data so they can give us, they can quickly give us a lot of training data and they can be accurate about it. Um, so what I'm showing is a screencast of me training a wing grooming classifier. Um, and so this timeline here is showing the manual labels. Red frames are, are frames where I've said that this is wing grooming and blue are frames where I've said it is not wing grooming. Um, one thing that we did is we asked people only to label frames where they knew what the behavior was, right? So in between a kind of when a, when a fly stops wing grooming, it's kind of hard to say exactly which frame they stop wing grooming at. Um, so we have the, have the user you know, leave a gap there where they don't care, or they don't know what the correct label should be. And that ended up kind of making this a better posed problem. Um, so we made the machine learning relatively fast. So all of those features that we talked about, those can all be computed very quickly. Um, so they're kind of computed. So both computing those features as well as training the classifier can happen on, in, um, on the order of 30 seconds to a minute um, using uh, boosting. And so this timeline here is showing you the predictions of the classifier. And so what we had people do is instead of just labeling all frames in the video, we had them label frames that they wanted to label. And so the frames that are most important to label are the frames where the classifier is currently wrong and they know what the correct label of the behavior should be. So they can kind of scroll through, find those frames where they, where, that are currently predicted incorrectly, um, label those and train a new classifier. So having the training of the classifier be fast allowed you to have this kind of interactive framework um, so this is called active learning. Um, it's a way of finding samples that are most informative to the classifier. So if you just have 2,000 training examples, not all of them will necessarily be very informative to the classifier. Some of them might be things it's already gotten right from other training examples. Um, and so we try to have the, the, um, the annotator find those um, good labels. So yeah, so it's an active learning framework. We find these more informative frames to label and you can um, train a classifier relatively quickly. Um, and we spent a lot of time on the, on the GUI so that you could kind of efficiently navigate and find these frames to train. And so you can switch from one fly to another fly. You can switch from one video to another video very, very easily um, and get a lot of diversity into your training data. Um, and um, so the, the other thing that having this interactive framework allowed us to do is um, to give the user some information about what machine learning can do and gain intuition and confidence in what Java can and can't learn. Um, and then um, what we found is also as you label data, if you kind of look for examples that, um, you know, as you look at the classifications that Java is giving you, it'll bring you to these frames that are kind of at the boundary between, you know, a backup and not a backup, right? Or a groom and not a groom. And that helped us crystallize the definitions of these behaviors by kind of looking at these hard examples and trying to come up with, you know, as a user decide if we want to have some very deterministic uh, rules there or if we just want to ignore those frames altogether. So I found that as I was training a behavior classifier for a behavior I hadn't thought a lot about beforehand, I would have to start over in training because my definition of the behavior drifted as I looked at more training examples. 
Um, and yeah, so um, having this um, interface where we don't label frames, where we don't know what the correct label should be, has been uh, actually important in kind of training uh, good classifiers from a small number of training examples. Any questions so far? OK, so um, here are some of the um, outputs of this. Um, so we trained, um, I think there are 15 different um, classifiers that we trained. Um, so there were kind of anything that we could think of that we saw the, the flies doing in the dish. So we have a bunch of locomotion behaviors, like walking, um, turning, stopping, um, walking sideways, which is crab walking, backing up. Um, and then we have a bunch of social behaviors. Um, and so this is a, um, a line of flies where we're activating um, um, some neurons that cause the flies to chase more. Um, and so we have a bunch of these social behaviors like wing extension, um, touching, chasing, um, uh, attempted copulation, uh, things like that. OK, so that's what I had to say about uh, behavior classification. Are there any questions on that? OK, so I'm going to switch uh, topics now and go to um, uh, pose tracking. Um, so this is another another application of supervised machine learning. So before we were just talking about, you know, we had these trajectories, we want to classify the behavior. Now we're going to talk about a completely different problem where what we want to be able to do is take as input video um, and output the, um, the locations of some landmarks. So we've decided that in this image here, these are the five points that we want to track on the fly's head, or these are the 17 points on the fly body that we want to track. And so what we want to do is we want to automate the procedure of going straight from video to the locations of these um, parts of interest, these landmark points. Um, so that's what I'm showing here. So these are um, a few different examples of our part tracking for, for fly bodies, um, where there are you know, points along the, along the legs of the flies, a few points on the head, points on the body that, that um, we've decided are interesting points to track on the fly. Um, and so we can use the same supervised machine learning approaches to try to, um, to, try to track these um, points. So what we want to do here is we want to take as input the image, right? So we're not going to use trajectories or anything because we don't have those. Um, and what we want to output are the x, y locations of each of these parts. Um, so this is a regression problem where instead of you know, just having a binary output of this is chasing or not chasing, we have you know, 17 points. We have 34 different numbers that we want to output in this case. Um, and so we've been working on that for a long time. Um, and we have a bunch of different algorithms that we've come up with for doing this, all kind of trying different types of classifiers. Um, we started working on this a long time ago um, when deep learning did not work as well as deep learning works now. Um, and so we have this algorithm called cascaded pose regression that is, has pretty fast training. It's related to kind of the boosting type of approach that, I, that we use with Java. And um, more recently, we've been working on these deep learning types of approaches. Um, and I'll talk mostly about that um, to give you um, uh, some flavor of kind of what uh, deep learning is doing now. Um, and then uh, we've been trying to do um, social tracking. So tracking not just a single animal, but tracking interacting animals. And we've been uh, adapting this algorithm called OpenPose for doing that. Um, but what I'm going to talk about mainly is this um, deep learning based approach. OK, so, so we've talked about uh, deep neural networks, right? Um, and now we're going to talk about deep convolutional neural networks. So these are the things that actually have been making the biggest splash in uh, machine learning are these convolutional neural networks. Um, so that it's very similar to what we talked about, where you have a bunch of different linear classifiers that are stacked on top of each other. But instead of having um, every single input connected to every single output in a layer, you have kind of small convolutions that you're learning. So what you're going to do is you're going to learn a filter of a, of a few, you know, maybe three by three filter that you're going to, you know, which is going to be this linear function. You're going to convolve the entire image with this filter, and then you get an output here. So instead of having, you know, one, uh, one uh, linear function for all, for, for each output, you have a single set of linear functions that you're doing for all of these outputs here. Um, and then you're going to, again, do some kind of thresholding type of thing. So it's, again, a linear classifier. It just has this filter type of um, uh, architecture to it. 
you're not going to just learn one of these filters, you're going to learn a lot of these filters and you're going to get a lot of different outputs. And then again, for it to be a deep neural network, you need at least two of these. Um, and um, you know, so you'll have a bunch of these different uh, concatenations of linear classifiers. The most, you know, the most successful ones have been the ones that are kind of the deepest so far. Um, so this is something that was successful maybe in 2014, 2015, I think it had, you know, this is on the order of 15 layers to this network. The kind of biggest networks now have on the order of 1,000 layers. Um, and a lot of the work is just trying to, you know, the mechanics of how you actually get something like that to train. Um, so, so this is um, the VGG network. It, at some point, was one of the most successful networks for classifying what was in an image. So the goal here was to take this image, you go through all of these different layers, and on the output you have the category of objects that are in this image. So is there a car in this image? Is there a motorcycle? Is there a flower? Um, a bunch of different categories. And so we're, we wanted to adapt this type of an approach um, to trying to to, to trying to do this uh, regression problem. So, so people tried this in uh, 2014. Um, this was the first deep neural network based pose regressor called Deep Pose. Um, and they basically took a very similar architecture to what had been done with um, image classification, but instead of having uh, you know, a category of this is a person, this is a car as the output, they just had these x, y positions. And it turned out that this didn't work particularly well. So this was actually worse than the existing approaches at the time, but it got a lot of uh, publicity because it was a deep learning approach and, um, you know, everything deep learning was popular. Um, the thing that actually made... Um, what, was, what was the output? Ah, the output is just the x, y locations of these parts. So if there are 17 parts, it would be this 34-dimensional uh, vector. The parts, <coughs> what are the parts here, the head, the head, the... Oh, in this example, I think this is the, I think it was probably, the, yeah, I think it's like the shoulders, the hand, the head. Um, yeah, I'm not, I don't remember uh, exactly what. Um, I, this, is, this is the part that they were labeling in this example I took. I don't know what that's supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, okay, so, but yeah, so there's, you know, people usually are trying to track the arms and the, the head. This so, you, how long it takes, for example? To train it or to? Yeah, to get to. Training, to training takes a long time. Um, classification doesn't take very long. Um, and it, it kind of depends on how much training data you have and how deep your network is, how long it takes. It really varies um, depending on what you're doing. Okay, so the thing that uh, made these um, deep learning based part classification or part detection uh, work was actually to turn this back into a classification problem. So instead of outputting the XY location, you output these feature or these heat maps where you put a little Gaussian blob or blur around the correct location. So you have an output for every single pixel location and then you have um, uh, you want to have a one where the object or the where the part actually is, and you have zeros everywhere else. So if there are five parts that you want to track, um, then you have five different outputs that you're um, trying to train a classifier for. Um, and so then you can start using these deep uh, network approaches. Um, you can see that what's happening here. There's a um, so the kind of output is getting smaller and smaller as you go along in these layers. That's because there's, there's two reasons for that. One is that when you convolve things, right, you kind of lose the border each time, so your image gets a little bit smaller. And then the other reason is that um, you do some downsampling at every step. So you'll go from 112 by 112 to 56 by 56, and it gives you kind of bigger, um, lets you look at more information at a time. And that made sense when you were looking at, you only wanted one output for the entire image. You just wanted to know, is there a car in this image? But it, what we wanted, remember, is we want to have an output for every single pixel location. Um, and so the type of network that we're using um, that's been designed for this type of um, output is called a UNet, where you have this same type of thing where you're doing this downsampling at every step. 
but you also do an upsampling step. So you take, um, you upsample using information from this kind of very downsampled um, version, but you also use information from the slightly less downsampled version. So you have kind of information coming from both directions here. And that unit type of approach, this, this architecture, um, allows you to have better resolution in your final output than if you just kind of stopped right here. Um, and as we saw before when we were talking about supervised machine learning, there's a lot of components to this besides what type of classifier function you're looking at, what the architecture of your neural network is. Um, and so, you know, there's the, how, you know, the training data, what kind of pre-processing, what learning algorithm you're looking at, you know, post-processing, you know, uh, what you're actually going to do with this data afterwards. There's a lot of components to this, um, this uh, system. And so again, we've been working on this kind of interactive system for, for training these classifiers to allow us to get good and a lot of diverse training data quickly. Um, so you can download this system here. Um, and so here are just some preliminary results. Um, so this is tracking these 17 points on the um, fly body. Um, and so this is the kind of old school machine learning type of approach um, called cascaded pose regression. This is the UNet based approach. Um, when flies are walking, this problem is a, an easier problem to solve because you don't have occlusions. You don't have the fly leg underneath the body of the fly, something like that. And I would say that these approaches look pretty similar in this case. If you look at flies that are grooming, that's where I think we see the differences in the two types of approaches. Um, so um, in this case, kind of the two front legs will cross in front of each other, and it's pretty hard to tell which one is which. Um, so, and, and, and if you look at the back legs as well, it's pretty hard to kind of say where things are. And it's in these cases that we see the kind of deep learning approaches, um, you know, uh, kind of anecdotally looking better than the um, original types of cascaded pose regression um, approaches that people were using. So we're still working on this ground truthing thing. So labeling, you know, a lot of ground truthing data takes, takes a while. Um, and we're still quantifying the performance of these different algorithms. So these are, um, what I'm showing here, these circles are, the, the radius of the circle is different percentiles of the error. So the blue circle here is the median error, the dark blue in the middle there. Um, and then this big red circle is the 98th percentile of the error. So there are 200 labels here. So that means it's the fourth worst training or fourth worst error. Um, and then just for comparison, um, so, so cascaded pose regression and UNet look pretty similar when we're looking at these walking flies. They're both worse than humans. Um, and um, yeah, things are, are a lot worse when we look at grooming flies, right? So grooming is where we have a lot more um, difficulties and we're still kind of working on, on that thing. And again, um, the performance of uh, the inter-annotator performance is, is better than this. So we, we think there's a ways to go here. Um, yep, we have lots of different applications we're working on. Um, and then here's just kind of a teaser of the types of things we're trying to do with the social tracking where we're tracking either multiple interacting mice or um, multiple bees at the entrance to a beehive. All right. Um, so what the, the way that these trackers have been working right now is they just take a single frame of information um, and try to output the, um, they have these kind of different heat map outputs for each um, part, right? Um, and so there's a lot of different types of context that we're not taking into account very well. So one of them is the relative positions of parts. If we know that there are the, the four parts, you know, four of the five parts are in these locations, we can guess that the fifth part is going to be over here somewhere. Um, and so using that type of information is something we want to be able to do. Um, so in the previous movie, you did not take um, movie sequences for training, it was all done on individual frames. We, we took movie sequences, but the training yeah. algorithm doesn't use them. It just uses... It the, just uses it just single uses frames. So it's doing pretty well for single yeah. frames. Like when I'm labeling something, I have to go back and forth yeah. in time to get that to work. Are you trying to use actually the sequences for training now? We are trying to figure out how to do that. There's not an approach that exists in Can't all... Can you simply um, expand um, 10 frames into one big frame and train them on that? Yes, we're, so, we've, one way of so you, can, you can try to do that. So actually the amount of context that I think you need is more than 10 frames is the problem. So like looking, 
So it's like 100 frames, I think. Um, and then you get into problems where your data doesn't fit on the GPU. Um, and so, so finding an efficient way of doing this is exactly what we're working on. So you Maybe can- Maybe do PCA then, before? Um, so the problem with doing PCA is then you don't want to do a convolution. Some dimensionality reduction to just squeeze your data onto a PCU before, on the GPU. The, the problem is that the, kind of then the convolution, the, the idea that uh, you, know, you want to have this, these, the same filters yeah, doesn't yeah. translate. <laughs> um, so we're trying. Yeah, you can do multiple <laughs> GPUs. People are always making bigger GPUs. You can also do recurrent neural networks, is the other type of thing that we're looking at for this. Um, yeah, trying to be smart about which frames you look at, um, attention networks, where, which tell us. This frame is an important frame to look at. This frame looks exactly like the frame you're looking at now, so you shouldn't use that. We're trying all. We're trying to figure out exactly how to do this, but actually, that, that's like that's not something people know how to do yet. Um, there's actually very little work on video in kind of academic computer vision. Um, everybody works on static frames. Um, yes. Okay. So yeah. So that's the most important type of context that. Um, we really need to start incorporating. And that's, um, yeah, what we're, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about how to do this. Um, the, the other thing that we have is we often have multiple views because we want to do tracking in 3D. And right now we're doing the tracking independently on each of these two views. Um, if you, you know, have calibrated cameras, you should be able to do better than this. Um, and a lot of these things are pretty um, hard to put together with you know, the kind of heat map based classification way that we're doing this. So we're looking at ways of, of um, using, kind of going back to this regression approach as well as having this classification. Okay. Um, yeah, so I've told you about using supervised learning for behavior <laughs> classification and for tracking. Um, and I'm going to spend five minutes telling you about what we've been spent doing with this unsupervised learning type of approach. Go ahead. Just ask a question. So, um, <coughs> if you can you use this uh, pose estimation as an input to the behavior? Yes. That. So one of the reasons that. So the reason one of the reasons we did this behavior this this pose tracking is because there are a lot of. Um, behaviors that are happening that we couldn't see from just kind of, you know, looking at the ellipse that we were fitting to the fly. So we can either have this as an input to a supervised approach, or we can have this as the input to an unsupervised approach, where instead of trying to work directly from the video and do unsupervised learning, we have these tracked parts and we can try to do unsupervised learning. So that's one of the reasons that we want to be able to do this part tracking. Um, we have some stuff that we've done with um, supervised behavior classification where instead of giving it these ellipses that are tracked, we give it the straight video and we can compute things like optical flow, so kind of estimates of how each pixel location is moving. And I think for some of the behaviors that we want to look at, like grooming, for instance, I think it's easier to detect grooming from the video, just kind of have that as your goal, as opposed to first trying to track the legs and then try to detect grooming from that, because tracking the legs is a harder problem than just telling whether the flies are grooming or not. So we don't know what the right approach is, but that was one of the reasons that we kind of embarked on this project. OK. Um, OK, so I'll talk a little bit about unsupervised learning. Um, so the thing that I told you about um, in the very beginning was kind of this clustering type of approach to unsupervised learning, where um, you, know, you, ha you just wanted to do things like k-means to figure out kind of what, what your different categories are. Um, but uh, it requires you to ha the, the, it's very important to have the right representation of your data to begin with there. So you had to decide that the speed of the fly and the distance between the flies was the most, two most important features about the, the fly. Um, and you know, those were the only important features. It really depends what your original representation has been, what was, sorry. And um, the kind of innovation in these deep learning types of approaches is that you're going from this raw representation of the data and you're learning useful representations 
of the data kind of in each of these successive layers of, of, of the network. So kind of this representation learning is kind of what's made deep learning, that's the thought of what's made deep learning successful. And so what we're thinking about are ways of kind of putting together deep learning and this kind of representation learning with unsupervised learning. So for instance, you could do a supervised task, you could train a classifier, and then you could just look at these intermediate layers of this, um, of this classifier and hope that those are good representations of the behavior. Um, so we've been working on this with, again, the same type of video that I've, I've shown you. Um, and the supervised task that we've given it is trying to predict the future behavior of fruit flies. Um, so you have kind of the positions of all of the flies in your chamber. So you're this red fly, and you want to predict what that red fly is going to do in the future frames. And you're going to use a deep learning architecture to do that prediction. We're going to, in particular, use these recurrent neural networks. So a uh, recurrent neural network is just like the types of networks I've been telling you about. It's kind of this feed-forward stack of linear classifiers. The only difference is that you have information from the last layer from the previous frame going into the first layer of the next frame. So it's kind of, you know, there's this kind of sequence to it. Um, and um, uh, so we're going to try to train this type of a recurrent neural network to predict the future behavior of fruit flies, and then hope that if we look at some of these internal representations, maybe we found something interesting about um, ways of representing behavior. Um, so the way that we've done this um, is we've um, come up with kind of a, a, a animal-centric view of the world, where the inputs to the, to the neural network at, at each frame, so this kind of input here, is a representation of what this fly is sensing. So we kind of have the locations of all the other flies, and we have kind of this 360 degree view, and we keep track of you know, how far away each fly is along each of these different rays. Um, and we have both something for kind of where other flies are, as well as kind of whether it's touching um, the wall or not, so kind of its distance to the arena wall. So we have some kind of representation of the sensory information of this fly, and then we want to predict the motion of the fly between this frame and the next frame. Um, and so we've tried a bunch of different types of neural networks for doing this. Um, we can either quantify how well things are working by looking at the log likelihood of things, but it ends up just giving us a number. The thing I found most um, uh, kind of the, the thing that's resonated well with me is looking at simulated fruit flies. So what we can do is if we predict the behavior of the, the fruit fly in the next frame, we can pretend that that's the real behavior. We can use that at, to, to define the input to this fly in the next frame, and then we can predict more and more frames and we can simulate fruit flies. Um, so these are simulated fruit flies. Um, so we've um, uh, just kind of using the neural network that's trained. Um, and you can see that they, perform, they, you know, they behave quite like fruit flies, right? So they'll um, chase each other. They'll stick their little wings out when they chase each other to sing to each other. They don't leave this arena, so they know that they can't you know, pass through walls. Um, they occasionally will walk through each other, which isn't um, a natural behavior, but we have a built-in physics, right? So, so you know, they don't do that more than, you know, that, that often, actually. And so I think you know, this is a way that we can um, you know, convince ourselves that we've created behavior, or we have a model of behavior that's, that's fairly accurate. But actually, what we really want to do with this is, you know, we don't want to just simulate fruit flies. It's not our goal. We want to learn something about fruit fly behavior. And so we're looking at these internal representations to try to figure out um, what the, you know, what, whether something interesting has been learned in these representations, as well as we're trying to uh, look at ways of making the types of neural networks that we learn be interpretable. Um, so there's things called attention networks that we're, we're trying for doing this to, to see if we can understand, you know, what, what is important about fruit fly behavior. Okay, so just to summarize, um, I told you about Java and in general how we do supervised behavior categorization. I talked about post tracking, which is, um, uh, again, a supervised machine learning problem, gives us a continuous output. But as we talked about, we want to use this both for behavior classification as, as well as for unsupervised learning. Um, and then I talked about um, using these recurrent neural networks. And I talked about using them mainly for this unsupervised approach, but we're actually trying them for kind of everything in between. Um, and um, just to end, um, 
I was told to come up with topics for discussion. Um, and um, I think some of these will be uh, similar to probably what Bob was tell you about, but you know, the things you've talked about is, you know, what is a good representation of behavior? That's the thing that our lab spends a lot of time thinking about. And so what are some properties that you might want in a good representation of behavior? How good does the representation have to be? What are you actually going to do with these behavior measurements to gain biological insight? You know, is it important to have the perfect representation of behavior or will any representation of behavior do? Um, and then the second question, I spent a lot of time telling you guys about supervised machine learning, and maybe you don't care about supervised machine learning, but may maybe you should, right? So how much should biologists understand about the tools that they're using, for example, machine learning tools for measuring behavior? All right, thanks.